Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing Alzheimer's disease with special guest, Dr. Elizabeth Edgerly, uh, Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Association of Northern California and Northern Nevada Chapters, Dr. Karen Gilbert, Vice President of Education Quality Assurance, the Alzheimer's Community Care in Florida, and Ken Zanes, President and CEO of Alzheimer's New Jersey. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited to be here and to uh, be able to listen to you describe the work of your organizations and your patients. I'm going to uh, go over to you, Elizabeth, but uh, first let me just sort of set this up because I'm constantly astounded by uh, some of the stats here. 10.7% uh, of Americans over 65 live with Alzheimer's, and that's uh, 6.5 million people, which means that anyone with a uh, broader circle, uh, anyone from the infant that has just been born to those of us who are older and our parents uh, knows people within their circle uh, who are who is affected by Alzheimer's. It really does affect everyone. It is a condition with enormous tentacles. So uh, going to you, Elizabeth, let's just start off with a sort of a level set. What is Alzheimer's disease? Thanks, and good morning or good afternoon, <laughs> wherever you're listening in from. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. But yeah, Mark, to your point, it's hard to meet somebody who doesn't know someone who's been affected by Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, because often we're talking about a bigger uh, group of conditions beyond Alzheimer's. But Alzheimer's is a brain disease that leads to dementia in typically older adults. And the symptoms, many people are familiar with the symptoms, especially short-term memory loss, having a hard time functioning well, doing things like driving, taking care of oneself. And so when, when we look to assess someone who's starting to have difficulties, what we look at is how are they doing handling their finances, doing everyday kinds of things that they used to do with no trouble, but now are starting to cause issues. So Alzheimer's affects our judgment, our reasoning, our decision-making, our ability to communicate and understand. And of course, most people recognize the memory issues. One thing that's very confusing is people almost always ask, and I would bet Karen and Kenneth get the same question, What's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? It's very confusing because these terms are used interchangeably. And it's not necessarily the case that we have a, 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 a real sharp definition of, of what are the causes of each of these different uh, conditions, right? So, so well, we're, yeah. we're dealing with language versus the science here, and it's not necessarily things aren't necessarily aligned yet in terms of the research and, and how, what the research is telling us of what, what it, Alzheimer's actually is. It can be hard to tell what type of dementia it is. Absolutely. And there's a lot of mixed dementia, which then you're like, okay, so what is this? It may be caused by small strokes on top of Alzheimer's, or it could, could be a type of dementia called Lewy body dementia. Uh, and I know that Karen and Ken have answered this same question, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia every day of their working lives? So let me just answer it. <laughs> and then I'd love to hear what Karen and Ken think of how they describe it, because it's it's very confusing. Dementia describes the symptoms, the cognitive difficulties that I just described as being associated with Alzheimer's. But the cause of the symptoms is the Alzheimer's disease. So everyone who's living with Alzheimer's has the symptoms of dementia, but not everybody with dementia has Alzheimer's disease. And so it's very confusing because families will say, well, my mom got diagnosed with dementia, but thank goodness it's not Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, so what is it? <laughs> so it's hard. And I just want to uh, reassure anyone who's gone through this, that if it was confusing for you, you are not alone. I would venture to say it's confusing to everyone when they go through this until it's explained to them. Yeah. So, uh, Karen, what, what, what Elizabeth is basically uh, saying, and if I can use uh, an analogy, Elizabeth, is that if I'm coughing, right, that's a symptom. But that could be anything from cancer to a common cold. It could be COVID. It could be a whole bunch of different things. You've got you've got a symptom. And that's what that would be the analogy to dementia is sort of the downstream 
um, and that, impact, right? Is that, that's the one I use most commonly when I'm speaking in the community. When they say, what is the difference? I'll use coughing. Coughing could be something extremely minor or heaven forbid, it could be an extremely advanced lung cancer. It is a symptom. And taking it even a step further, when someone has symptoms of dementia, which again, as Elizabeth said, it's not just the memory issue. It's the failure in those everyday executive functions, paying bills, programming the washing machine, and so on. When they have symptoms of dementia, we need that quality diagnosis as to what is the most likely cause. Uh, because even in someone uh, well older than 65, symptoms of dementia could be caused by something treatable. Right. Yeah, I always, I always describe it, um, you know, a little bit differently. Um, you know, when people say, well, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, there is no difference. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. And I always have people think about it as a big umbrella. You know, dementia is the big umbrella. And then underneath the umbrella, there are different kinds of um, different named diseases that are, you know, that are all types of dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common. And, um, you know, Elizabeth mentioned um, um, vascular, um, and that's second most common. So, you know, so it's, so I think we're all saying the same thing. We just explained it in a little bit of a different way. And that's one of the things that, that that's so important is that you're accommodating your various um, constituents, the people that you serve, in terms of your explanations, there isn't one way to address any need, um, even if the need is is a, a common need that that cuts across divisions of race and orientation and background and wealth and so on. There are different responses and different ways that you can explain these things. I want to ask ask you all a question. Um, this is one of those situations where the symptom is also something that can be treated in a way that actually improves the trajectory, in other words, reduces the future trajectory. In other words, if you're having executive function problems, if you're having processing problems, the actual practice, almost like working out, right? The practice of, of going through executive function skill can have an ameliorating effect. It doesn't have a curative effect, but it can have an ameliorating effect. Could you each talk about the kind of programs that you provide? While there is no cure, there are activities that can be engaged in, there are threads that can be pursued that lend hope and that give control. Ken, why don't you why don't you start us off and then we'll go uh, to Karen and then uh, Elizabeth can, can comment. Um, how do you uh, provide hope and control to people who are confronting something that can um, lead to despair and hopelessness? Well, I think, you know, a lot of the programs that we provide focus on, on caregivers and, you know, teaching caregivers um, how to best manage the disease. And a lot of that has to do with, um, and especially as the disease progresses, you know, immersing yourself in the place that the person with Alzheimer's disease is and getting to the point where, and this is probably one of the hardest things that I think we ask caregivers to do, but it's basically, you have to forget about the facts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and remember that you're, even though your loved one may have gotten to the place in the disease where they don't remember who you are by name, but they likely remember the relationship and the emotion and the fact that you're an, imp an important person, you know, in his or her life. And so as the caregiver, that's kind of what you need to go with. So, if, so Mark, if I can have a whole conversation with you, but you think I'm your dad, I'm not going to spend time correcting you and telling you that you're not. I'm just going to go with the social interactive conversation that you and I can have together and so that becomes, you know, the most important way to, to really engage and to give the person with the disease the dignity that, you know, that they deserve. Well, what you're talking about is going with the energy that you are confronting at that particular time, blending with it, and then creating an experience that is as, as additive as possible for both parties. It's a, that's a real art. It's a, it's, it's a very meditative. It is. You it know, definitely it, is. 
And and uh, Karen, how do you uh, help people um, navigate this 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 care piece? Um, are there approaches that can give people who are afraid of the loss of control some measure of of that control back? Well, we do a few things. Uh, for one, is we have a team of nurses uh, that are dedicated to working with the caregiver. Uh, we know that our families cannot be successful staying together in the community if we don't address and assess the needs of both. And then we also operate uh, specialized adult day centers throughout Palm Beach, Martin and St. Lucie counties. And the specialized center actually operates on a very strict Florida statute for nursing oversight, health monitoring, individualized care plans and so on. And so what we try to find uh, again, looking at every one of the participants as incredibly individual. No two will be alike, even if they have the same disease, diagnosed at the same age. Uh, they will be incredibly unique in the way they express the disease. And so we try to uh, hone in on what is still working, what skills do they still have working? And we are going to work those. We're going to create a care plan Anecdotally, do we uh, do we believe that this may slow the progression? We do. Uh, we've had patients in our day centers 15 years and more uh, after diagnosis. That's a very long time. So uh, we do believe that that type of approach uh, is helping, honestly, more than than any medication we've come up with until now. Right. So we find those strengths by doing cognitive screens. We observe. Observing the person is a great way to find out uh, what they are still good at and what they still enjoy. And then we tailor that care plan to really work uh, those skills and abilities. And then, of course, we share that information with the caregiver who may not know that they're interested in painting or whatever. Uh, but we, we give the caregiver those tools because our day centers run Monday to Friday. Uh, we want to give uh, tools for them to use on weekends and holidays as well. No, yeah, Karen, I, I, oh, sorry. No, I think that's great because it, it just sort of um, I think it illustrates what I was saying earlier about the importance of finding some way to connect, you know, and and I think as a society, um, you know, we have spent, you know, years and years and years focusing on the deficits and what people with Alzheimer's disease can no longer do. And I think what Karen's describing is how do we focus on what they still can do and make those connections that, again, you know, give back, you know, the, as much independence as possible and certainly, you know, the dignity that, as I said, people with this disease certainly deserve. Is Absolutely. There, is there evidence, and, and Elizabeth, uh, maybe you can comment on this, is there evidence that these, that these treatments actually uh, slow progression? Are there, are there? Mm. Are they, or is this more about hope that isn't necessarily supported by evidence? How do, how do you see it from, from the point of view of, of sort of the metrics? Of I, how... I would agree with Karen's statement about, which was more anecdotally, that you, you witness it. Um, certainly when people are living well with Alzheimer's or related dementia, and that's been a theme for our early stage individuals, people who are newly diagnosed or with mild cognitive impairment, they want to do as well as possible for as long as possible. And that often means living a normal life with friends and family and children. And, and so how can we help that? And, and so some of the lifestyle things that I know that Karen in the day programs is exercise, eating well, interacting, creativity, there, there's some evidence, I think music has the, the, the research on the impact of music on the brain and on those living with Alzheimer's is really exciting. Uh, but I wanted to mention sort of the alternative. So you think about being meaningfully engaged, doing the things you love to do that make you happy. Uh, and then you think of not doing those things. And I think that COVID and during the pandemic, we unfortunately had an experiment taking place of what does isolation do to mm -hmm. those living with Alzheimer's and the mortality rates for those living in circumstances, typically facilities, long-term care facilities during COVID were completely isolated and died in higher numbers, not only from COVID, but because of the devastation of what isolation and lack of stimulation, it makes me, it gives me goosebumps. It's so sad to think about how not only did COVID 
kill people directly, but for people living with Alzheimer's and dementia, they languished and died a different death. So not to be so dark about this, but it really speaks to the importance of human connection and interaction and love and all of that, that it, it, it makes life worth living right. for all of us, whether we have cognitive impairment or not. And so a lot right. of our work with early stage individuals, interesting, they've said to us, you know, I don't need a program necessarily. I want to be with my friends. And so as providers, you know, I think we would all agree, we only get to see a small number of the people living with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. And in a way, that's a great thing. Uh, but I worry that many people do this alone. And they don't actually, you know, have the, the positive experience at home. I think sometimes they struggle on their own. And so as a society, as these numbers keep growing, we really need to find ways to reduce the stigma and make it more just part of living to be able to interact with the world. If I have cognitive right. impairment, I don't need to be relegated uh, to, to a different place. I can engage with everybody. And there's dementia friendly across the country that actually that's the, the message of Dementia Friendly. Everybody's welcome. Can I ask you all a question about um, our healthcare system here in the United States and the insurance <laughs> situation? Ken, you're already, you're already uh, <laughs> yeah. getting a of, of, of dissatisfaction. But the question really is, it seems that we're very good uh, when somebody breaks a leg, right? In other right. words, it's very specific. There's surgery, it gets done. It's, it's done in a short period of time and so on. We seem to be not so good in um, in a whole bunch of different areas where we really seem to be lagging behind, including things like um, uh, prenatal and uh, post-birth care uh, for women. Um, uh, another area um, it are, are things like um, long-term care for people who have um, uh, long-standing conditions. We hear all these different stories of people who are bankrupted by a cancer diagnosis or or uh, an ALS diagnosis. And then we have Alzheimer's, which is definitionally, and different types of dementia are definitionally long-term uh, issues. Uh, Ken, since, since uh, you kind of gave, <laughs> gave a bit of a tell and wow. then we'll go to Karen, could you just all comment on what, what, sure. how are you dealing with, it, with, with this type of issue? And what should we do that that would improve mm. things? Because we're all going to get older, right? I mean, um, you know, God willing, we'll we'll all um, live to an age, and then 10.7% uh, of us will contract Alzheimer's, which will be some of our friends and some of our family, and maybe ourselves. Well, Mark, you you already said it. It's a huge problem. You know, we have um, you know we have a system. We have a Medicare system, um, which is really, you know, an acute care system of care for people over the age of 65. So, you know, if someone falls and breaks their hip, um, everything related to that care, you know, will be paid for by Medicare. Depend I mean, for the most part. But if the reason that the person fell and broke their hip is because of the confusion related to dementia, well, that's not paid for at all. So unfortunately, most of the services that caregivers need, um, you know, help with, um, you know, Karen had mentioned their day program. Well, Medicare doesn't pay for that. That's out of pocket. And if someone, if a caregiver needs help in the home and wants to bring in a home health, um, a home health aid to help with bathing, dressing, that's not paid for either. So, and then long-term care, unfortunately, is not paid for either um, by Medicare, except if it's, um, I believe, if it's rehabilitative in nature, and then it's only for a certain amount of time. So, you know, on we talk to a lot of caregivers who think who've made that difficult decision that for whatever the reason is, and, and those reasons are, are um, emotional and complicated and individual, I can't provide this care at home anymore. So I'm, you know, want to look at a long-term care facility, but Medicare will cover that, right? Uh, no, the answer is no. Um, so it is a huge problem. And I don't think there are any, 
easy answers. I mean, at one point, and I guess to a certain um, to a certain point, long, having good long term care insurance is part of the answer. But, you know, we've learned that that really is not the answer, um, you know, for a lot of, you know, for a lot of different reasons. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely one of those issues that I think really has to be solved, you know, on the federal government level. And um, right now it just isn't. Karen, could you weigh in here? Uh, we just took a poll and 100 percent of the people who responded have been affected by Alzheimer's. 100 percent. I mean, it's, it's not 90 percent. It's everybody. Um, and I, I think we can extract that and, and uh, apply it to to the population at large. Um, and uh, we have a lot of people who are who are quite worried um, uh, about this. That was the second poll. Um, well, how, how do we deal with this as a society? Well, we need to counteract this notion that Alzheimer's is something you either get or you don't, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's not true. Uh, even if someone in, thinks they inherited the gene that puts you at higher risk, it only puts you at higher risk. It doesn't mean you will develop right. Alzheimer's. So while the research goes on and the research is critical and it's getting better, it's, it's focusing in on the early stage patient finding them because they are the only ones benefiting by these recent medications, Adahelm and now Lacanumab. Uh, we're getting better at that, but we're not there yet. So what can people do? Lifestyle choices can overwhelm your genetics. And in this country, we have an extraordinarily high percentage of people with high blood pressure and type two diabetes, two conditions that are A, largely preventable and B, largely reversible, should you develop them. And as Ken so correctly said earlier, vascular dementia being at the root for so many people, possibly second only to Alzheimer's. Well, now recent research is saying Alzheimer's disease may be the reaction to the vascular damage incurred by high blood pressure and diabetes. So it seems to me that if we can really educate, really motivate people to take control, uh, to, to not develop type two diabetes or address it aggressively should it occur, uh, to uh, do the same with high blood pressure, the numbers just might go down. Uh, a lot of recent research is connecting that vascular damage to the development of Alzheimer's. So again, thinking of Alzheimer's as the result of something else might actually start to uh, right. incentivize that type of attention. Uh, again, the numbers for type two diabetes and high blood pressure are just extraordinarily high. So that goes to the whole issue of prevention, right? In other words, exactly. the, the interconnectedness of prevention and incentivizing preventive care and preventive activities rather than just intervention uh, uh, activities when you break, well, a, break a leg or, or need insulin. Right. We have been reactive, we have been reactive to neurocognitive disease, where we've become proactive with different types of cancer in the last 40 or 50 years and achieved incredible uh, survival rates and cure rates. HIV is an example, how we became proactive and took that from something that was a universal killer to something that someone can live with, but never develop the end stage of AIDS. So we don't need to invent a new logic. The logic is there. We just need to apply it to brain health. Elizabeth, you, yeah, want, I, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, well? I love that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, yay, Karen, you go. Um, <laughs> You know, there's been research in, oh gosh, it's probably been five years now, the Sprint Mind study. And I think that's what Dr. Gilbert may be referring to, where they looked at the impact of high blood pressure on risk of dementia. And uh, after doing the study where they showed people who had even just, in my mind, slightly high, like mm -hmm. 135 over 90, had a significantly yes. higher risk of dementia. So much so that they stopped the study and said, okay, we need to control blood pressure mm -hmm. to more like 120 over 80. And let me just say, this is a general statement I'm making. There are individual differences around blood pressure, depending on age and other health factors, but they, it looked as though we could reduce the number of cases by 20% if everybody who has high blood pressure, myself included, 
was really good about taking the medication and of course doing the diet and exercise and all the other things that we all know we should be doing. But 20% is huge when Mm -hmm. you're talking 6 million people. Um, The other thing I wanted to share, and I don't know if Kenneth and Karen have heard this, but I, I, I really resonated with this statement. I heard uh, a presenter say that Alzheimer's is a midlife disease that leads to dementia in late life. Mm -hmm. And it really goes to what Karen was talking about is we do have some control. We don't have all the control, but we have some. And so if we can address things in midlife, and I'm talking thirties and Mm forties, you know, I I don't know about you, but in my thirties, I was not worrying about blood pressure. I figured, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm fine. And yet turns out I probably should have been a bit attentive by the time we're older. I, I see older adults very focused on blood pressure. You know, the damage may have been done. You know, we're seeing in the response here, uh, Elizabeth, to the current poll that um, there is a great emphasis amongst respondents to shift resources to treatments that reduce the impact and and progression and Mm -hmm. behaviors that reduce the impact and progression. So maybe the crowdsource logic that let's not put all of our eggs in one basket, which is the intervention stage, but instead right. prevention stage wow. where we should go. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Elizabeth, um, before we move on though from you, um, there was a question um, that was contributed by an attendee. And the question is, do your organizations provide services and programs for people with Alzheimer's who also have Down syndrome? Because 95% of individuals with Down syndrome will develop uh, Alzheimer's. You care to weigh in on that, Elizabeth? Yeah, I'd be happy to start and then happy to hear from Kenneth and, and Karen on that too. We do. And and um, we, we do a number of things around individuals, not only with Down syndrome, but other intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities, where as they get older, they also can develop dementia and Alzheimer's. And it can be completely turn their worlds upside down where they may have established a good living situation and be surrounded by people who care about them. And then when they develop dementia, what we're seeing is sometimes they're no longer able to stay in their housing that they've had their whole lives. So we do have programs, uh, certainly our 24 seven helpline, our referrals, our resources. There's also nationwide, the Administration on Community Living, which is a federal institution funds programs specifically for that community. And so across the country, you will find different programs and, um, if you wanted to leave your contact info, I'd be happy to share information about web-based information and things that are available no matter where you are. And again, I'd love to hear Kenneth and, and Karen if you have services right. uh, for a broad community around Down syndrome. And there's research taking place too. We're funding some research on why is there that connection? We know about the genetics, but to see if there's more that can be done to help people living with Down syndrome. Right, and uh, in in our uh, organization, we have uh, patients with the whole spectrum, Huntington's, Down syndrome, chronic trauma, um, a dementia associated with Parkinson's, and then also the diffuse Lewy body disease, uh, certainly vascular uh, impacts, people who have had significant strokes. Um, So our organization was founded in the 90s when the talk was just beginning about Alzheimer's. <laughs> so that was the right. one disease everybody was focused on. And now we've learned we've got uh, right. a broad spectrum. And again, there's no rule that says you just get one. Uh, you can have a mixed d- uh, dementia, which uh, some of the researchers are saying uh, is the second most common, is that there's mixed pathology. So how do you know? Uh, We are fortunate uh, where we are located. We have an uh, an incredible number of uh, certified clinical trial investigators who are well-equipped to make that definitive diagnosis. If it's at a point where they can benefit with clinical trials, of course, they would be offered that. 
Um, as far as we're concerned in our day centers, the precise diagnosis is not what drives the care plan. The behaviors drive the care plan, the skills, right. the interests. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I think when we see a huge problem and uh, certainly our state, Florida, is, uh, I believe, second only to California in the number of diagnosed patients, uh, it's also an opportunity. We see huge opportunity, again, to encourage a proactive approach. And frankly, even if someone does have uh, an identified diagnosis, let's say of Alzheimer's, if there are other things going on that could be made better, like their diet, if their diet could be changed to an anti-inflammatory diet, if they have a B12 deficiency, which is so common in all of us over 50, if they have untreated hearing loss, if we fix the treatables, they may actually be able to function better. Really, really important, the connection. Ken, um, you want to weigh in? Well, I, I actually wanted to, um, as, it's interesting, you know, two things. So as far as um, um, Down syndrome and dementia, we, we just did a, a conference this past uh, spring with a, a local um, a nonprofit partner. And the topic was exactly that. And um, so there is a lot of, again, it, it's being recognized more. And, um, you know, there's certainly, um, you know, uh, some of the programming that we do are similar to what, you know, Elizabeth and, and Karen just mentioned. Um, but, you know, because of that need, you know, we had put this conference together, you know, on that specific topic. I also wanted to jump back, though, um, on the whole prevention issue that we were talking about before, because I do think it's really important. You know, we are learning a lot more about brain health and, you know, the idea that brain health is just as important as physical health. And there's so much exciting research on prevention. Some of it, a lot of it is very new. I just don't want anyone who is listening to this, um, this webinar today to sort of go away thinking, okay, if I, if I eat right, if I exercise, if I do all these things, I will not get Alzheimer's disease because we are not there. Um, we are definitely not there. And I also don't want any caregivers to think that, you. well, my husband did all that. You know, my spouse did all that. My spouse read and my spouse was physically healthy and did all the right things. And my spouse still got Alzheimer's disease. So, and there's a lot of, you know, I think we have to manage and, and I think all of us, I think would all agree that part of our responsibility as organizations is to really sift through all the information that's out there and help caregivers manage expectations. Because, you know, part of managing the disease is having the right expectations. And I just didn't want anybody to walk away. Even what, you know, what's been said here is, apps, you know, is important and it's factual but again, we don't want anybody to walk away with the wrong idea. So I just wanted uh, to make sure we said that. It's a very it's a very important point. And we're going to have another show on the uh, fundamental research that is being undertaken now to address some of these uh, threads. As a matter of fact, um, in that show, what we want to do is look at different um, research uh, threads and have experts uh, talk about uh, what they're doing and why they're following those those different threads because we're still in a real investigative stage. There are no conclusions uh, uh, that that uh, are satisfying uh, yet here. But I'd like to thank you all for your work. I'd like to also remind everybody that it is election day. Now, everybody should vote, but here's the point. Alzheimer's doesn't care what political party you're with. Alzheimer's affects us all. It affects every American, it affects everyone in the world. And we should just think about that. We are bound together by so much that we have in common. Let's hold on to that and, and uh, really try to come together to solve these common problems like Alzheimer's. Dr. Elizabeth Edgarley, Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Association, North California and Northern Nevada, Dr. Karen Gilbert, Vice President of Education Quality Assurance, the Alzheimer's Community Care in Florida, and Ken Zanes, President and CEO of Alzheimer's New Jersey. Please thank your constituents, your staffs, your volunteers, your boards, your funders, and please thank your patients because they are part of this fight as well. They are the empowered people who 
we serve and who help us become better uh, people for it. Uh, thank you so much and and have a great day. Stay safe and and thanks so much for for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you, Mark.